Welcome, everyone. We're very excited to have you tonight at our panel. This is the thing that we do every time we have students in town. I am Dr. Roseanne Welch. I am the executive director of the Stevens College MFA in TV and Screenwriting. And we always partner with the Writers Guild Foundation to create a panel that celebrates women writers who write about female stories. So tonight, I'm especially excited to have a panel of women on shows that we often I would say the business often takes for granted. We don't take teenage girls seriously, and these shows do, and offer a new generation of girls a new way to look at themselves. And this is exactly what we like to put forth in our program, and exactly what we like to help the Writers Guild celebrate. Uh, so I'm very pleased that you're all with us, and I hope that you enjoy our conversation. I'll briefly introduce our panelists. You have read the materials about them, or you wouldn't have signed up, right? But we're happy to have um, Sonia Karkar with us, and she's from Never Have I ever and on my block which is a show that I only recently discovered through students who wanted to write a sample of it and I've been binging it now so there we go always lovely uh, we have Alana Pena from the diary of a future president which is particularly an area where people tend not to look into that daytime young children viewing and I'm so impressed with the show and so excited to be able to talk to people about it uh, we have Riri Chaney who's here from the babysitters club again something people weren't sure they would take seriously and yet when you watch it how lovely they have brought this show this book to fruition and taken all the seriousness that was in the original book um, forward, which I find really great. And then I'm supremely excited to introduce our fourth panelist because she is a graduate of our Stevens College MFA in TV and screenwriting. And she's a staff oh. writer now in her very first job on Generations, which is coming out on HBO Max. And this is Christina Nieva. So yay! If there was a whole room full of people, there would be lots of cheering and dancing and all that lovely yay. stuff. <laughs> Um, so we're very pleased that you're all here to listen and we know you're out there in the ether somewhere and so we want to talk about the importance of telling girls stories that help them grow. So my first question always to people who are writers who have made their living as writers is what was the material, the medium, the books, the TV shows or the movies that spoke to you in your own teenage years, right? So while people are thinking about that really quickly, uh, I'll admit that this is at least not an original, it was in rerun. But when I was a teenager, the Patty Duke show was what you had to watch. And that was what you dreamed of being. And the movie was Grease, and they were not. We know John Travolta and Olivia and John were nowhere near their teenage years when they played in that, and yet they were our role models. Um, and then I read a book, uh, my favorite book was called The Witch of Blackbird Pond, which is about a young girl from the Caribbean coming to Puritan New England in the early days of this country. and and attacking being a teenager in that era, which I found really fascinating. So those were the things that were, that gave me points to look at and say, that's how girls and women could behave as they move into their womanhood. So who would like to start today? Shall I call on someone? Like, oh, I can go, I can yes. go. Um, so I'm thinking of my teenage years in a time long, close, soon passed away. And the thing, the show, I was a big TV person. I was, I, my mom always said, like, what are you going to do with all of the, like, knowledge about trailers that you have in your brain or, like, coming next week, next week on? And I was like, I don't know, I figured it out. And I figured it out and I became a writer. Um, so, but the show that like really changed my life as a teenager was Grey's Anatomy, which is not about teenage people, but it's about a lot of feelings. <laughs> and I think that, you know, the luxury of soap allowing you to like, just really say everything that's on your heart and beautifully scored and people in, in couture scrubs, like really like spoke to me. But it really, I think it also like fed into like a hyper verbalization of like intention and aching that really like spoke to like a mid Atlantic girl in the, in the odds. So I think that was my Beautiful, beautiful. All right, who else? I have a similar thing. Um, just, I kind of skipped the high school era for some reason like I was big into um like Friends and Seinfeld and stuff like that um just all the real like the whitest shows <laughs> is what I watched but um yeah I liked just like 
women and girls who had a lot to say. Like I loved Harriet the Spy when I was really young and like Beauty Bloom, all those characters. And then, um, and then Felicity, just, yeah, girls with a lot of feelings, girls with a lot in their minds, just like confessional kinds of things. Perfect, that's perfect. That makes perfect sense. All right, who's next? Yeah, I, I mean, go. oh, sorry. No, please, go no, you please. go. <laughs> Well, I just, cause you mentioned, um, yeah, you know, the Judy Bloom of it all and the, it was books for me. Like when I think about this era, um, uh, the Judy Bloom books, and then like, there were so many other book series that I read that had complicated girls at the helm. And a lot of times they were in first person, they were being written and th these girls were like so flawed and so messy and like that's where I feel like girls had permission to be messy because I wasn't really seeing that on screen um, as much. Um, and like Lois Lowry had like the Anastasia books and I was obsessed with them. And like Phyllis Reynolds Naylor had the Alice books where they were like, you know, with and then um, Beverly Cleary obviously with like Ramona and Beezus and Paula Danziger with Amber Brown and Anna Martin with Babysitter's Club, like all these books. When I think about what kind of shaped my perception of like complicated girls, it was literature. I feel like all y'all's answers are so thoughtful and I'm about to be real embarrassed because the first things that came to my mind were movies and um, I, w I lived for Center Stage. Yes. I'll do. Okay. Yes. That was my movie. Um, and Cruel Intentions was another really big one. It was like so scandalous to me at the time and really like like hyper sexualized and sexy in, in a way that I had never seen like it's one of the first like sex memories that I have of a movie um yeah and can't hardly wait was another like teen movie that I really loved a lot yeah so I don't know what images I was really consuming there with that combo, but that's where I was at. Amazing. I mean, it's so the width and breadth of the things that we've seen and how they affect us is always so fascinating, especially in forming writers when we don't even yet know we're going to grow up to be writers, even that that job exists sometimes. All right, so here's a harder one. Is there a moment from some media that you watched as a young person or even today? that was cringeworthy and you're like oh i can't believe somebody it's so not true that is not how a girl would have behaved i do not i do not believe this at all i mean you talked about greece <laughs> oh my god <laughs> what, beautiful 30 year old stalker channing playing a 17 year old didn't really hit for you <laughs> Well, and worse, because the message of that movie, of course, was, oh, Thank no, the only me. answer for the girl is to transform to get the bad boy, as Change opposed yourself. to him. Yeah. I'm trying to think of, like, the hard messages were you will be, like, the best friend to the guy, like, the smart girl will get trapped in the in the friend zone, and it's only until you, like, flirt with their rival like weirdly like something that's popping in my head is like one tree hill which was mm -hmm. like like because I, I guess i was of that like cw i mean i stayed just really like watching west wing on too much um so i'm trying to think but there was that like very bright friend who the everyone kept being like he's not looking at you he's looking at that or i think there was just like that I think now we're allowed to be a couple of things. We let like our female, like our young female characters be a couple things. You can like thinking of like Booksmart. I was, when I saw Booksmart, I like had such a crush on everyone involved in that, that uh, movie because you shut that, like we're smart. So we didn't get laid shit down immediately when everyone was like, Oh, I'm going to this school. I'm going to this school. Like, I have a plan to, you know, like uh, start a bank or uh, build a build a boat. Um, that was really amazing. And we let our young women be ha and contain multitudes, which I think that's the thing that I wish was told. Oh, Gilmore Girls. I figured it out. It was Gilmore Girls. Because I wrote a column in high school about the portrayal of a nerd 
in Rory Gilmore and how she made me feel inadequate and how I thought that was the like you had to stay in that lane and that show like derailed what I thought was possible for girls who like are studious um so of course I wrote a, a op-ed in the school newspaper about how I felt uh, this, this <laughs> well, that's brilliant that's what we're supposed to do that's how you yeah. get the ideas out there that's so true I will I could talk about the Gilmore Girls for a long time but I won't right now <laughs> if y'all have other thoughts about that well it's like you you Girls were not allowed to be like more than one thing, but they also had to be everything. Just thinking about Rory, like she had mm -hmm. to be like, smart and studious and a good girl and really pretty. And like you, I don't know. And even the movies like where the girls changes nothing about herself except takes off her glasses. Obviously that stereotype. Yeah. Um, just like you have to, there's, you can't be flawed and you have to live up to all these expectations at once until like someone sees it in you. Like someone has to recognize it in you and call it out in you if you're the character. Mm -hmm. Like it's not like you, the sense of agency wasn't there as much. Yeah, it was very much like uh, the, I was thinking about like she's all that and the trope of like taking off the glasses and it's like she, you know, she was an artist and, and it wasn't until she was a, like she ultimately could be an artist and attractive, but it like she had to really journey far to get there. And I think that whole perception of like, you're amazing someone just has to see that in you is like also damaging because what about like you seeing it in yourself and I think it perpetuated this myth of like my true love just needs to like see me like it, it's all it yes someone just said the taming of the, yeah. the shrew like that that they whole thing of like you. yeah and you lose total agency in that because once Freddie Prince Jr. sees you as something then the movie can begin you know and that's not great True. Well, true. There is a little bit of that, like, once you give up yourself, you get to be the girl who is seen in slow motion. Yeah. If you don't, like, sacrifice, not even sacrifice, but if you don't real, like, place yourself in their vision, in their box, then you don't get to feel that rush of having the lovely man on set put the fan in front of you so you float downstairs in a perfectly couture <laughs> red, uh, little red dress, which if anyone knows where that dress is, always, always welcome. But it is true. It's like, okay. and that's so hard for tiny people to like have to take in because we're taking in everything. Like I, I can't imagine what it's like to be um, small now. Like we had to go to a movie. We didn't have like all of these platforms telling us different, you know, kissing booth and then you, you do the kissing booth and then you work it and then you do this. And I'm like, all those teens, God bless them. Tell all the boys I love. It's like, God bless you. <laughs> funny christina any thoughts on this or uh it's making me think of this book that i recently read um that i picked up as like a, this is going to be like an escapist like fluffy little like fun thing to read and it enraged me so deep like and i'm not this person like i am not the i'm gonna write an email person but i wrote an email about this book and was like yo this character blows and this is why like you know, the protagonist, like she was like, every, every femme and woman in the book had body image issues and was like, she was obsessed for like 400 pages with this like man who was clearly like a sociopath. And it, it, like, it was leading to no point. It was, you know, and it was a book that like maybe, you know, 10 years ago, I would have like lived for it. And this job has ruined my ability to do that now. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's a benefit. That's a benefit. But then this nameless author, she was really cute and woke about it. And she was like, yes, if I would have written that in 2020, I think I would have made some different choices. And like, sorry about it. <laughs> and I was like, cool. We had a little dialogue. That was cute. My first email was a success. See, I think that's wonderful because that's how we make change, right? We have to yeah. tell people and talk. that's conversation. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. All right, I was very so, generous, though. I just want to say in my email, it wasn't like an annoying email. It was like, I am a writer. I get it. However. That's <laughs> totally love fair. Process, yeah. I love totally that. Fair. Human woke, man. Yeah. I just want everyone to know, like, I'm not out <laughs> here writing those kind of emails. Yes. I don't know. All, with, all with love. All with yeah, love. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Love and light. Positive love and light. Always. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. All right, so let me flip that question and now say, now that you are in control of some female characters, What's 
a moment you've been able to give a character that you're proud of putting out there for a modern younger audience? What's a moment that you've been able to write that maybe wouldn't have existed like this author if you would, you know, now we're in 2020, you're able to really speak to these characters and bring something of yourself into them. What's something you're really happy you had the chance to say to a young female audience? Um, I think I, so my episode of uh, Babysitter's Club, um, I was really, I was really proud of that because uh, my, our showrunner, Rachel Shukert, who is fabulous, um, really has such this love for these books, but we had to update it and you try to make it modern and try to, uh, do justice to the books while also making it um, relevant or call to youths and also apparently many, many millennial women at, at, in their homes wearing robes. And um, we were dealing with like divorce. Like our episode was about divorce. And people have been talking about divorce on television since my parents broke up since a lot you know it's over and over again and it used to be like a very special episode then it became like oh of course like you know it's only the tension and i think we're vacillating between it but i i think because folk might think of it as like a subject that's been dealt with i'm not i don't think we see it we've seen it from the perspective of the kids in like a delicate way other than that like passing shot of um, like someone seeing a suitcase, you know, or like the adults retelling the feeling. So I, you know, like I have a great relationship with my parents, but you know, I didn't grow up with them together and I wanted to speak to the feelings of like blame you put on yourself and isolation and loneliness, even if you do have a great relationship with your kids, even though the character I was writing for doesn't have a great relationship with her father anymore. And so I was really proud that I was allowed to infuse some of what five-year-old Riri was feeling into the mouth of a very, very talented 13-year-old um, because I think it's okay to feel these big feelings about something that's supposed to be over. You know, like when you're little, you're like, oh, well, I was little. I was, it was five years ago. Like, girl, are you still 12? Like, that's still wrong. <laughs> um, and so we worked really, really hard on that because Anna Martin, like, it was like one of the first series where like three of the girls' parents were single parents. It's awesome. And, like, yeah. And like having, I literally went into that meeting being like, hello, my mother is uh, named Michelle, but uh, I have a Liz and she raised me and she made me very strong and made me uh, a poor hypocrisy in anti-feminist uh, actions. And that has made me the nightmare I am. Please hire me. And they did. Um, <laughs> so I really wanted to do that justice. And I think we were able to do that. That's beautiful. All right. Who's next? Um, so I was, a, I was a really late bloomer. Like I'm probably like closer in age mentally to the characters I'm writing than like I am now, like really late, like any day now. Um, so yeah, I often find that I like what I'm going through in my life and my relationships is like actually really relevant to what we're talking about for the characters. And I think I was just like talking one day about like just in the room about my, about my life and I was like not pitching and I was just like, you know that thing where they're, like people say like you have to love yourself um, before you can love anyone else. I'm like, well, that's never going to happen. So like, <laughs> and then we ended up um, putting that into it's, it hasn't um, aired yet or it hasn't been shot yet, but um, putting that into a storyline about like one of our romantic storylines um, where a character on my blog just realizes that, that, that their relationship is like super codependent and maybe she needs to take care of herself and it's all about self care. And it's like just something that I felt like I was, this is such a cheesy thing to say. Oh my God, I can't believe it's about to come out of my mouth. But I was like learning from what the character was going through, like as I was writing it. Um, and yeah, I feel like, especially as someone who likes um like grew up on romantic comedies and teen romantic comedies and it's so often like what you're we saying before like so often about choosing between like this guy and this guy like ben or noel jess or the other guy in gilmore girls um <laughs> dean and uh <laughs> that's hilarious that is how he should be <laughs> um, i didn't even watch that but i know that <laughs> that's that's the power of this stuff and i feel like <laughs> um yeah, so it, it just, it feels cool to give girls just like another way to think about it and to be able to learn for myself too. That's been cool. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. All right. 
Other thoughts? Well, I don't think um, I can oh. talk. Ab oh. yeah, you're, oh, it's, it's your turn. Up. It's your turn. <laughs> Um, I, I quickly, I don't think I can like get into the story since we're still, we, we not out yet. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We ain't hit the streets quite yet, but, um, I can talk about Viva, which is definitely like, um, you know, female forward. And, and I think we, our viewership was like, you know, across the board, like so many people were spoken to, including young women. And I think like something that I contributed that I was really proud of um was just like the role that religion and spirituality plays for women and specifically like in my experience as a latinx person like how it can be one of the most oppressive forces in your life at times as a queer person as well but then also can also be a source of community and strength and solace and can feel like home, which is really confusing as you grow up and get all these conflicting narratives about like, God loves you, but only if you do this, 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 and this, and Jesus saves, but only if you do this, this, you know, and I very much grew up that way. And um, so being able to like speak to that and have the characters like really grapple with religion and and spirituality especially in this last season season three of be that like i was proud of that that it wasn't one or the other and that the women were really like lynn specifically one of the characters like really had to wrestle with that it was cool to me that's beautiful and i've always thought that spirituality is that other aspect of a personality that we often don't explore in television because people are afraid of it and yet it's so truly a part of so many people's lives mm -hmm. cool all right, Ilana, what do you think? Oh, I was just going to say on the same sort of line of the divorce of it all. Um, my dad passed away when I was younger, and I, we put that in the show that the, these um, this family lost the father, that he died, um, which I think is like, it's funny because people would say, you know, oh, it's a Disney thing. Like, that's a trope in Disney, but that's not, It's this is my my, my real life that I was basing it off of. Um, but for me, it was important to tell a story about grief that wasn't like a tragedy, that wasn't defined by the grief. Um, because like, yes, it's, it's something that is like hugely important. And we have a whole episode that, you know, explores, I mean, we do it in more than one episode, but we have a specific episode where we really touch on like the loss and change and how change is grief. And, but it's also like, you know, when you're a 12 year old girl waking up in the morning, you know, I think a lot of people look at that they assign a lot to, to kids of grief. And it's just like, you're a child of grief. You're like a bereaved kid. You're going to wake up and you're going to like look at the empty chair at the table. And like, only then can you start your day. And like, that is absolutely a part of my story. But it's also, I had crushes on boys and like the musical to rehearse for and best friends that I was fighting with and buying my first bra and how to infuse a true life. And and tell a story about a family that like where joy was also where you looked at the the chair and it was also you could infuse joy into that um and i was really proud that we were able to tell this story that it could be a family comedy that grief where grief was a theme that's beautiful and that's going to make me ask sonia kind of how did they deal i mean we know the first season of never have i ever but how did you feel about the way you guys handled grief in that um that was really like a credit to um, Mindy and Lang, who I know are pulling from both of their personal lives. Um, Mindy, obviously Mindy and Lang Fisher, um, who's the showrunner. And they, um, I think that they did a really good job of, they actually brought in um, a child psychologist into the room to talk, um, talk to us just about how it would be handled, like in a very real way um, and kind of changing the psychologist's character and making it feel like, not just like a comedy aspirational kind of thing, but like handle this in a real way. And um, sorry, I feel like I haven't thought this question through. Um, but I think, I think just like keeping it like as vulnerable as possible and as real and as grounded as possible and going for the feeling, even in like a hard comedy fun kind of show and just like not being afraid to go there was great. I also think that for Never Have, Ever, Never Have I Ever in particular, like mental health isn't something that's like discussed in, um, in Indian families a lot. And I think even the fact that she was in therapy was great. 
Um, but then like, uh, they went even deeper with like, then bringing her mom into therapy and just showing like how much it can be about like, okay, just go to therapy, like do your thing. Like this isn't, you just have to like go to your meetings and fill out this book and it's not going to be a thing. Um, and seeing like the mom, her mom actually like go through the process herself and see the value of it. I think is great because I'm sure it opened up some conversations with my mom and I definitely talk about it. Um, and yeah, I think just keeping it real and keeping it like, this is just, this is part of it. This mental health part of it is really important. Was was great. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's to me what stood out on the show, watching her go through that. Um, and that it was this beautiful framework across that whole first season to get to that acceptance point. No spoilers. <laughs> Everybody should watch all the shows that we're talking about today. Okay, so um, from a writing standpoint, um, although uh, Sonia did mention she's a little closer to being a teen, right? We're all a little closer to being a teen in our brains, but we're not. Um, so what kind of research did you have to go to really think about what is happening with modern teens, whether that has to do with the language, whether it has to do with what they're listening to, or how they're behaving out in the world? What kind of stuff did you peek into? I can take this one because I feel especially lucky in the sense that one of, so on Generation, uh, one of the show runners and creators is actually 18. Her name's Zelda Barnes, and um, she is complete, an entire force onto herself and so brilliant. And she's there in the room every day. And so oh. we can be like, yo, Zelda, do y'all kick it like this? Do you really talk like this? Is this really how teenagers, like, are? what are y'all on? You know, and she can just tell us. And she really is like our authenticity check, you know, and um, it's really lovely to see the things that, yeah, X number of years later are still absolutely true and unchanged. <laughs> and the things that like are so not a factor anymore or, you know, have wildly changed. And like um, one thing on our show, um, we have like a little, like a team motto is like, inside out so we we really try to like have all the storytelling never feel like it's sort of like from whatever outside perspective but really from inside you know gen z teenager um worldview because i think gen z like they're just there's something about this generation that like they just call bullshit like they just know bullshit they know when you're not right writing in their voice when you're trying to like have a like teachable moment when you're like too like edging too close to like PSA territory and they don't have a problem being like nah that's not how it is and and like you're corny and stuff so I feel really fortunate and like I think our show of course like benefits so much from having Zelda there and she like is just constantly yeah giving us the real and we even got to she like brought some of her best friends one day when we were still in an actual room all together and uh we just like <laughs> it was kind of wild but we just sat there and like listened while they like just like kicked it with each other and we were able to like just you know get all these stories and colors and vocabulary and you know confirm that none of us are part of youth culture anymore <laughs> but like you know um yeah she's been like the point of all of this is that you know she's been like an invaluable resource as an actual real life 18 year old it's been very helpful i've learned a lot the amount of google the times i've googled like cool slang words 2020 <laughs> it's so embarrassing and i'm like i don't feel that young or i mean that old um i just feel like i don't have my shit together so why am i googling this like I'm not, um i feel like though i being online, like being on um, Twitter and Tumblr and looking at TikTok, like from our fans or like just other, I'm a big Taylor Swift fan and a lot of Swifties are young. And so I'm just like looking at Tumblr all the time and Twitter and just like seeing like the way they talk and um, like what they care about and how, how deeply they care about certain things. And um, I think, yeah, I think just like being like following a bunch of um, like lurking on Tumblr and Twitter. Now I sound like I'm like, going to be the subject of a Dateline episode but you know just like just being in those communities and like seeing how they talk um has been just for research purposes I guess really really great and, and it also just like energizes me and makes me be like this is why I want to live in this world and not write about like real adult 
problems. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, uh, the internet's wild. Uh, the internet is, uh, terrifying, um, but handy. I think it's like, it does break down the lines of, even though I still sometimes find myself saying like, what are the youths saying? It's a little easier to like intersect with these different worlds that I think what, I think that's like a very different vibe than, the people writing the shows that we grew up on because they probably were just like, what's my kid doing? Not necessarily like, what are all these different kind of kids like trying to get authentic for like different types of stories than um, are the ones in your home. But I think I also like, I'm very lucky that I have like very bright young things in my life. So like I wrote a pilot about high schoolers a couple of years ago and my little sister was still in high school at the time. And I texted her being like, Ma, can you send me a list of shit? And she, what I realized first was, I texted her that, she immediately FaceTimed me back. And that's how I realized they all FaceTime. <laughs> and that's like every script I have with a youth now, they're like, what's good? I'm like, y'all are like, so, it's so close. It's so close to me. <laughs> but it was like, even in that action, I realized like, what you know what it was like figure that out and then I was I was working on or I was an assistant on Orange is New Black um in a past uh blessed life and we were having a um like a what's dope what's whack conversation and all of it I was the youngest person there I was like I haven't been in high school in years so I texted my little sister and she sent me a list broken down but she asked me what part of the country first and I was like <laughs> let's say Maryland she broke it down by like like white girls black girls like the Latin girls she did like broke it down of like what the look looks like where it's whack versus when it wasn't I was like the the anthropology of this generation <laughs> is crazy but I trust her <laughs> very much I also feel like now the feedback loop is so much faster like the internet being like just like equalizing all the trends like when we were younger it just like took longer and yeah more diverse maybe too and now it's just like something's cool everyone's doing it then it's not so much faster right it must be crazy well I think it kind of also depends on like what communities people are abiding from yeah so, like if we're, you know I a friend of mine explained to me that like the or no not the a friend disclosure the documentary because why nothing is in real life anymore I can't remember <laughs> anything um they were talking about that cycle of like old Hollywood um like trans communities drag mainstream back and back again and how it is just like a glamazon eating itself <laughs> and I think that also like is a like part of like the language we use like at what point is it you know hearing like a cis white girl saying like what's the tea like th that has been like that's six like how long has drag race not been on um logo like that's five years mm -hmm. yeah. it's kind of amazing to look at like the speed with which the language of, of the children are is sometimes not giving the credit to the communities they're they're biting it from actually yeah, I feel like my answer to this is a cheat because I'm so impressed hearing all of you. We, if you watch my show, which someone asked what I was talking about, Diary of a Future President on Disney Plus uh, is the show. Um, we never say what year it is, and that's like a specific um, choice. Um, because when I pitched the show, I said it when I was a teenager um, in the early 2000s. And then um, Disney Plus was like, well, you know, we don't want it to feel too like niche and one. And I think that was even before Pen15 and Pen15 did it and did it well. Um, but they were like, we don't want it to feel too niche. Like, can we set it in like 2020? But I think honestly, I was a little bit like, oh, uh, I, I don't, I wanted it to have like a timelessness. I wanted the show to feel like it had that kind of a sheen over it where we wouldn't have to stay as up to date with the references, which is why, again, like it was, again, like we kind of cheated. But, um, so I applaud all of you guys, but I remember we were talking of like, okay, so what are references that make sense? And we were like Crocs. Crocs feel like they've been around long enough that they're, they're not like, you know, um, Gloria Stefan, the musical Wicked, like what are things 
that people can reference, but they're not going up there talking about like, be more chill, which is like, for all you musical fans, a more new musical that I don't really know much about, but I think the teens really like it. Um, so we always called it the now-ish. Um, and then we talked about like the future where you saw as president is the future-ish. I think it was also born because we didn't want to say this teenager is growing up in 2020 and you have to wait however long it is for like her to become president. We wanted it to all kind of feel like, you know, the, uh, you know, the, someone once said like, the, the now-ish is yesterday and the future-ish is tomorrow. Like we made it a little bit more vague. Um, so we didn't have to be all on top of Gen Z, but also we still want to make it something the kids could enjoy. So we're constantly checking ourselves and it's like, we don't want to be, you know, we don't want them to think that we're old. And even on set with the kids, I like, I remember there was some line, I forget, and I asked one of the 14 year, 15 year old boys, I was like, do you guys, do you say this? And he was like, he like gave me a look like he didn't want to say no. <laughs> and I was like, you just say the thing. He was like, I was like, what would you say? And he like had answers. Um, so having the teenagers there to call us out when we're not cool is also helpful. <laughs> they don't even say cool anymore, I don't think. Yeah. <laughs> it comes cool and goes. <laughs> they do. I feel like cool is, my friend has an 11 year old who's like, yeah, it was cool. And I was like, oh, okay, great. <laughs> okay, great. That makes me feel better. We definitely say it in scripts. I love that crops are timeless, by the way. I like that crops are the yardstick for what's timeless. <laughs> uh, like making, in, speaking of teen culture, making fun of my ancient history teacher for the Burks and fabulous socks she was wearing in 2005. And now my fuchsia Birkenstock wearing behind is just shuffling around <laughs> in Michigan. <laughs> That's how you know you've grown up. <laughs> I love my my Bergs are my quarantine at stable. Yes, <laughs> welcome to Quar, babe. Mine are uh, bright like neon blue, not neon, um, shiny blue. They're like love shiny that. blue. Almost lost me. <laughs> well, you just brought up. Speaking of quarantine and life changing, I am going to ask you about the makeup of the writer's room that you're working in, in terms of kind of who are the folks in the room, how many, that sort of thing. Um, and certainly now let's also talk about any changes that have happened when you move from the actual room to, of course, the Zoom room. So just let's hear kind of what the room is like, who's in it, um, in terms of hierarchy, in terms of maybe what their background is, that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, I'm in, so uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this. Ba uh, Babysitter's Club hasn't officially been picked up, but we are acting as if we would get, we'll hope, you know. Um, so our, but the season you saw, I'll do that one. So the okay. season you saw, um, it was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven writers. Um, uh, six were women, one was a man. Uh, this year we have two men, crazy. Um, uh, we had a um, woman who's of Asian descent. We had, I, uh, I don't know if you can tell, I am black. Uh, we had a Latinx writer. It was, I think also because we were making those changes to those characters. So in the books, everyone's white except for Claudia. And there was a decision to have, like, if we're going to have Dawn be the stereotypical California girl, that girl is more melanated these days. So let's actually have her um, be an, a Latinx girl and, like, make that about her family, about her story. So that was kind of the makeup. But we also, like, our order was 10 episodes. So it didn't have to be, you know, an army. It was a very different vibe. And it really allowed, I think also it allowed forward to be more personal because it was such a small room um that we like you know you all everyone runs onto their riffs of like just there if you caught the Les Mis reference in the finale uh, you would be right um so like we that all came out of just you know the normal writer's room chaos <laughs> but also I think it also writing a show about young girls and it being mostly women yeah that it was pretty no-brainer and I think Rachel was trying to go for that um and I like have historically like I worked I worked for Genji Cohen for a couple of years and Orange was I said I grew up as a writer inside of a uterus um so <laughs> I'm very used to being in in rooms that are mostly women um and that's just my reality I have never been in a room where there I have been very lucky I've never been in a room where there have not been mostly women very loud outspoken women 
Um, My favorite kind. Yeah, exactly. Like, be articulate, honey. Um, I'm sure I'll get got by another one of those. But uh, for the time being, I think it has allowed, it allows for a level of intimacy when you're writing stories about uh, young girls or uh, drug smuggling inmates to have those sort of, um, that sort of background. Beautiful. Who's next? Yeah, I keep saying, like, um, I recently did a different, um, like, similar panel situation, and everyone was of varying degrees of experience in this business, all women, and, you know, sharing some of their um, war stories, and I was just like, wow, I feel so blessed and have nothing to say, because I've been so lucky and fortunate, like what Riri was saying, like, like, not to be like all, you know, inappropriately positive about it, but like the landscape is changing. And like, I too have been in rooms that, like I've never been the only Latinx person. I've never been the only woman. I've worked for so many badass women um, and and queer people and um, people that are really like walking the walk as far as like understanding the importance of like, telling authentic stories and being inclusive, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, my boss is right now being being amongst those people, absolutely. So our, in our room right now for Generation at HBO Max, there's seven of us. Um, and uh, three women, no, four women, three men. Yeah, all cis people. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I I'm, I want to steal the um, like I I grew up in a uterus or however, oh uh, whatever that was because I love that. Um, I came up in Crazy Ex Girlfriend um, as an assistant there, which was such a nurturing environment to be a, a woman starting out. It just you know mostly women, women co creators, flawed female characters. Um, you know, talking about literally writing about uteruses, writing songs about uteruses happening as you walk by, like that was, um, and that was such like a, a blissful way to serve. I mean, it wasn't my first job, but it was the one where I kind of kept, it's the one that raised me, I like to say, um, raised in a uterus, that's easy. Um, but uh, so yeah, and so with my show, we really, you know, I wanted to to have an environment where we, like it is, you know, mostly women. It's it's an environment that we truly, you know, empower everybody to pitch, whether you're an assistant. Like I give the assistants episodes. I want everybody to feel, I want people to feel the way I felt grow, like coming up so that we can continue the cycle and keep giving people opportunities. Um, with my show in particular, it's a, you know, Latinx family. It's based on my family. So it's essential that we have writers you know, of Latinx descent in the room, but that's also, we want to have all sorts of diversity of like perspectives and experiences. We have black writers, queer writers, Afro-Latina, Filipina, like people who have not just in terms of like their background or what they look like, but just a, a well of stories to tell because you want to approach something that's that's universal in its specificity. Like you want to just be able to, to tell stories and to like what Sonia was saying, to go on that tangent and, um, have that lead to something you you want to be able to have a well of experiences to to uh, draw from which i will say to answer the second part of your question about moving on to zoom is like it's it's harder to do that on zoom i would say um it's not impossible we moved we're writing season two right now and we moved uh midway through we in march um we had started in february so we had a month in person on season two um and we still definitely do that. We still like go on tangents and stuff, but there is, and I don't know if um, you folks can relate, but that sort of um, electricity and like authenticity of just being in a space with another human being that I'm talking about with such reverence because I miss it so much mm-hmm. um, and in general, but specifically in work. I mean, I think we didn't all get into this to like, you know, sit. This is literally where I sit all day and do and do a version of this. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I think that that's, I, we're, we're productive. We're getting it done. I still laugh so much every day and we're still able to share stories, but it does feel, um, I just, I miss, I miss people. (laughs) We all do. We miss the audience. I forgot to speak to that part of it. 
uh, us as well like we met in person and then transitioned and I feel so lucky for that like that we had like about six weeks of connecting in person I, I can't imagine like kind of starting season one especially of a show in a yeah. zoom <laughs> situation yeah. but people are doing it you know and a vibe is a vibe even if it's over the internet yeah. so you know it it felt bizarre how how similar it was like how unchanged it was in many ways um and at, at the time I was still the writer's assistant and hadn't been promoted yet so it was kind of my job to make it seamless which I think I did um <laughs> but um yeah I I think I think you know like establishing that chemistry might be more tricky if you're starting for, you know with a whole new batch of people but you know it's also like kind of the same yeah. in my experience yeah, I don't know I started on, um, on my blog oh sorry oh sorry. no go ahead honey oh uh yeah I started on, on my or I've been on, on my blog for years and then we transitioned to zoom um around the same time and uh it's so we have definitely a flow going just in terms of like how we work and our chemistry as a group because we're mostly there have been there since season one and it is it's weird just because we know each other so well, so we can be more, it's almost like we're more efficient when we're working, but yeah, we lose the the tangents sometimes. And like, there's also this like feeling that, you know, like we're all online shopping a little bit, but like never at the same time, you know? So like no one's ever like clicking in terms of like where the energy is going. And sometimes you say something and you don't hear anyone laugh and you're like, was that bad? Or you're just not paying attention or you can like see that someone's like reading their email. You know, um, <laughs> I will say it's a positive, just like, um, or like, you know, I'd be like late, like getting out of the shower in the morning, just have my video off and no one would know. Um, <laughs> and that's not a way to work, but, um, uh, as a positive, like we do, I feel like we're, we are, have been more efficient and like, I do the boards in that room and like the boards are so much easier to do in Google docs, um, <laughs> than writing on the whiteboard. That's a positive. Um, yeah. And to answer the first part of the question about, um, the makeup of the room. Uh, on Never Have I Ever, I'm not on season two, at season one, um, like I'd worked with Mindy for years, like on the Mindy project and stuff. And she came from a, a really like white male, you know, space, like with the office and stuff like that. Um, and so I think, especially this time, like the makeup of the room is much more like, they're like having just like multiple Indian girls in the room, like that not just like me and her has been like insane. Um, and I also think that it's like, uh, it's cool to have just like people who can relate more to like a certain character, which is not always like you're the voice of this character, but mm -hmm. it is nice to just to not like tip it. Just if we had all Indian girls writing on that show, like it would maybe be just like the same, the, the same voice um, a little bit too much. Uh, but I think just having like a diversity of experiences has been really good um, compared to um, what like I saw on the mini project and stuff. Not to say that that was bad, but like, just like it, it brings a different energy. Um, and then on, on my block, um, we have our show, the showrunner or the creator, one of the creators is white. And then um, Lauren, she came from, she created the show Awkward. And then she co-wrote with um, Eddie Gonzalez um, and Jeremy Hatch. And it's kind of based on Eddie's childhood, like growing up um, in LA. And, um, and Jeremy's his writing partner who's white. And then everyone else on the staff is, um, like Black, Latinx, or otherwise POC, which is great. Um, like, I, I'd never been in, like, in a room and experienced that before. Like one day we were off like in a satellite room just working a small group of us and I looked around and realized that like no one in the room was white at all. And it was just like a crazy feeling that I didn't, I mean, I didn't like dwell on it. It's like, what was there to think about? But like, it was just- a Oh, dwell on it, honey. I would have <laughs> dwelled. <laughs> It just felt like it was like a like a sigh of relief or something because I also like I grew up in a really white community like white spaces um and so I'd kind of never experienced that in my life and yeah it was just cool and even like working on a show like on my block like it's about black kids and latinx kids um growing up like in a very specific community and I didn't come from that world at all um but I do think like Ilana was saying there's just like universal experiences that you can bring like I could bring is like a child of immigrants or whatever um you know that relate to the characters or there's just so many ways to connect as someone who's been like any kind of I guess outsider or just felt that way in their life at all and I think 
both of the shows have been have done a really good job of just like bringing that out in people and like staffing a variety of people who can speak to that um yeah also i think something that um not enough people talk talk about what sonia was just saying it's like when you have someone else who shares that big affinity group with you whether it's you know someone else who's queer someone else who's your shade of brown some you know because there is and we're who knows what's actually going to happen after this you know black square you know we are aware movement of this summer but it is wonderful to be in the room and like you have to look at who's in the room and so that's amazing but what's really amazing is if you don't have to hang all of the pressure on just yourself and there is nothing better than looking across the table and having someone be like do you want to take this or do I want to take it because the first time I was ever able to do that I didn't know how much I needed that until I almost started crying and so I think that also is like looking for and it not it doesn't necessarily isn't your skin color or your sexuality or your gender but also like that shared experience of being children of immigrants being a children or something trying to find the person in the room hopefully if the room is tetris well finding another person who has that shape same or similar well of experience so you guys can share sharing your knowledge um really it like it lightens your soul <laughs> Um, and I will say there have been times where like, because you don't have that other person, your soul is heavy. Um, mm. and you have to kind of, um, you know, buy a nice robe, you know, uh, take care of yourself. <laughs> you have to do everything you need to do. And I think also off of that, like, it's super, it's been super great just having, you guys have talked about this before, um, just like women at the top, like who are the decision makers, like who are deciding like which pitches get in the episode so that when you're. So that's just the general tone of the conversation is just in that kind of space where you, you can like, like I feel like if I told a story about just like a universal like female story, like teenage story, like, um, like oh, oh, you also like weren't allowed to shave so you had to like steal your dad's razor as a kid? Like, oh my God, like, <laughs> sorry, I think my dad is watching this. I did that. That's up. And it's also his birthday, happy birthday. Happy um, birthday. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> But just like in a in a male space, or that's just an example, male female. But if it's like a white space versus a um, you know POC by POC space, or a um, like sorry, I'm losing my words, or like a queer space versus straight space. Just like just having someone who is not from the majority space at the top and at like all levels is has been just awesome. Like like even just like I also think that like having coming up as an assistant and like seeing the assistants on our shows now just like the young women assistants for some reason are usually like the people who are would have been fans of the show had they not been working on it you know and mm -hmm. like they just feel for it more strongly can speak to that perspective too like even aside from like a representation sense just like being invested in that on that level is cool <laughs> mm -hmm. I yeah, love that. off of that like just the idea too of like I feel so blessed coming up under like I really came up under Tanya Saracho and like her wing of love and love she's her. my sister from yes way back of doing theater together many years ago but like being having some of my first experiences in television be with all latinx rooms like a hundred percent like you can start those stories from such a different place yeah. you know when you share um whether it is like being able to be in a room like riri said where it's like you know there's one dude in there <laughs> you can start those stories i can imagine from a much from a different nuanced yeah. place right like whatever you don't that have to thing explain, is you don't have to explain as much because something about them seeing the chemistry between you you don't have to like answer the questions is that really true because right. somebody else is there to be like yes like she just said it and you can get into the nuances of the things that are different like yeah. you know what i mean like why like how two Puerto Rican 20 somethings could still have a different opinion about something well, and yeah. a different reality of something and a different experience of something. And you can get into that where it, we don't become just swaths of woman or brown person or whatever. Yeah. Um, One well, to the, the soul can be lighter so that you can make a television show. <laughs> like yeah. to what you're saying, like you have to, you know, it's like to carry that burden, like writing a TV show is already a task. 
to all to be to have to carry a burden alongside of that like to have the lightness to just like pitch jokes and have you know and delve into story and not have to speak for everybody or like am I doing this right am I and like carrying that and and the you want your soul to be free to play in the world that you're in um and that's I think such a huge thing to having a room that lets you play and lets enlightens your soul this is an excellent place for this conversation to go. So now I'm going to ask you to go a step deeper and let's take a minute. Can you think of an actual thing that happened in an episode, a thing that we're talking about where you got to go deeper into that? Is there a moment between two characters or something you got to do that you knew you might not have done if the gatekeeper above would have quashed that because it wouldn't have been something they recognized or understood? Uh, yeah, so the historically black character in Babysitter's Club is named Jessie. She is a ballerina. She is fabulous. Um, and Anna Martin describes her as just like a really like cool girl. She We introduce her spoilers. To, you know, like Black Twitter was asking. So if anyone wanted to know, she, sh she shows up at the end of season one and she go continues in season two. And we started our room in Zoom. So we like... I luckily it was season two and I have a lot of love for these people already, but I don't know if anyone has checked the news recently. June wasn't great. So we were having a lot of conversations about, you know, we have made this show that's kind of an idyllic show. We're not really like, all of them, we're not really dealing with like uh, current events, kind of like the now-ishness of um, future president. So we were trying to figure out what to do and I was just like in this like very I was I was just like in Bantu knots in a haze like I didn't really know um, <laughs> how to deal with it but I think I said because I was hearing a lot of like broken-hearted white people really like making making leaps making making pitches and I was like you know what the thing that would make my body and spirit okay if we had a scene of all black people not talking about pain and just having a good time I don't, you know, we have, like, Dawn is historically, like, an activist, and we have, you know, wanting to uh, child care, and we have, like, uh, family unit stuff. We have all these big things these girls deal with. The problem that I don't think enough people realize is that it is still, like, highly political to see two Black young women on screen chilling because very often the makeup of it is you are that black friend in there or often like, or, you know, if you are a brown person in a teen drama, then like it's, she's coming from another hood, you know, like it's a different situation. And, or if there's like a bigger, you know, we're trying to say something bigger. This isn't what this show necessarily is all the time. And I thought it would be fabulous to just have like this little girl who, uh, we made biracial and so she doesn't have, doesn't have a lot of black people in her life go to someone's black black ass home and have a wonderful time um, and my boss listened to that and so we're doing it and I like you know I don't like to you know wave the the mallet of black judge very often because it's like it's a lot it's a lot and I'm not you know we're all just trying to do the best that we can, I hope. I hope everyone's trying to do the best we can, but I felt very, it was a mix of being listened into that room and also looking at what the show were doing and trying to actually like fight the impulse to make a, you know, no one needed to be tear gassed, you know? Like I needed to figure, like trying to do my job as a writer while also representing what I wanted what I would have what would have made me a little like I did my job for um some of the little girls that I hope take this into their spirit. That, that's what I have to say about that. Anybody else? A moment, a thing like that? I think that's beautiful. That's exactly what we're talking about. What is the exact effect that you've had on that show coming from your background? That's beautiful. So I mean, for me, because Diary is, is my show, um, I feel very lucky to have been able to make the show that 
I wanted to make and and the the concept of this you know Latina girl becoming the president in the future shouldn't be this like revolutionary headline making thing um but it is um to, it's so funny though I think I still have this like naive this 12 year old like naivete of like like but she can be anything she wants to be like why are you sensationalizing the you know even in the in the kindest nicest things it's like it's still um it's not or it's not um it's not not revolutionary yet it's not it's still just like uh such a thing with a capital t because it's not ubiquitous because rep you know we don't the the people who govern us are homogenous and have been for you know ever <laughs> so um i'm just happy that i was able to make a latina a president and that i was also able to show her coming of age and have it be um imperfect and have it not be that we not have her be rory gilmore have her mess up and learn from it because that's okay it's okay that she's messing up and it's okay that that doesn't mean she won't be a good leader and it's okay that she's also not doesn't look like everybody else that necessarily we've seen be a leader and all of those things are okay and all of those things are not just okay but they're we can celebrate them and it can be fun and it can be funny and she can have a mustache emergency and like that you know we can we can see ourselves in her hopefully um so i'm just proud that we have been able to do that and my hope is that you know by seeing it by and by seeing the coming of age and kind of normalizing the flawed coming of age which i think all of these shows i mean i haven't seen generation but um all of the shows i do so brilliantly and i know that will too um is just show these like flawed female characters um where they can have permission to mess up and they can have permission to learn from their mistakes and grow and not be um, expected to be everything. Um, and uh, I think that it's just been a real joy to write someone who's like unapologetically smart, um, but who also is like strong willed and passionate and like loves things fiercely and like sometimes messes things up and her friends and family get mad at her and, and she has to learn and grow. and. And also she becomes president and, and all of those things can be true. And hopefully girls watching can be like, hell yeah, same. Mm. <laughs> mm. Hell yeah. Sonia, <laughs> Christine, anything about some moment that you were able to bring to it that you wouldn't have done in a different room in a different place? I don't know if I can say, but rest assured, I'd be slaying in my judge all over the place. <laughs> 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 Sure. When's the show debuting? When do we know we can watch? Generation? Girl, you know, no, nobody know the answer to that. <laughs> That's so no uh, fair. Yeah, we can tell you but, anything. You know. Release dates are <laughs> mystery. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mystery, science, television. Uh, yeah, don't treat people sure. asking. Nobody knows. Nobody yeah. ever knows. Unless all sure. of our shows become animated, then. <laughs> I mean, oof. Yeah. Sonia, did he have a comment on that or? Uh, on the question, I'm just like, have I made no impact on anything? I've seen? Girl, <laughs> I see those posts. You're doing something back there. Um, I can think of like <laughs> examples of other people doing this. Like when we were, you were talking about um, just like it's revolutionary to see just two black girls chill. And I feel like that's kind of, this isn't my um, like torch that I'm carrying, but I feel like I've, I'm supporting it. But just like when like Lauren and Eddie were, and Jeremy were coming up the show, it was just like, this is, it's not about like, it is about like a kid who's in a gang and who's caught between like being, you know, having this life outside of the gang in the neighborhood and getting out um, and all of that. But that's kind of like a backdrop and it's, we're trying to show like the joy um, and how much like, it's, this is not a neighborhood people just want to get out of and escape. And it's not, it's not just like that they have a, had a tough childhood. It's like, no, this is their life and they love it. And um, just kind of like having all of the stories just be about that and, not about you know what this tragedy and yeah and i think that just for me too there's just a sense of responsibility maybe an inflated sense of responsibility of just like just looking towards like hope um for these characters like whether it's like an on my block hope that like you know showing our kids like going to making it to like prom or going to college and all these things or like on um never have i ever if it's like you know, an overachieving Indian girl getting to like sleep with the guy in the swim team or, you know, just yes, that, representation. Like, you know, yeah. That, <laughs> sexual representation. Yes. Nerdy Indian girls. Um, 
But yeah, I think that just seeing, seeing just how much fans respond to it and how deeply they care about it and how like emotional their reactions are. And like, that just makes me feel like, I'm like, oh, this is why we do this because this is why representation in this little section of life really matters. Like when I watched Never Have I Ever um, for the first time, like I was part of the show, I knew what it was gonna be, but I watched it and I still like, it just hit me like deep in my soul in a way that I wasn't expecting. Just like, cause I'd never, I wasn't into Bollywood or anything when I was young and I'd never seen like, I'd never seen like an Indian American teenage girl like on TV, literally. And I think, I don't know, just the, the fact that like the shows exist and that we are like putting ourselves in those rooms or getting into them and people are letting us be there is just, that's like a feat in itself. <laughs> It is. It is entirely. It's what we're celebrating here tonight. That's the thing. All right, I wanna, before I get into everybody's origin stories, I do want to go to one more place in your individual shows. We're talking all about teenage girls, but um, y'all remember my so-called life, right? Big teenage show back in the day. The thing that was interesting about it was, of course, that the mother character was, is equally important to the extent that mothers are never, they have never trained to be the age they are and to manage children at the stage of teenagehood. So you all kind of do a pretty good job with the parents in your shows. Again, don't know about Christina's show yet, but I'm wondering- It's really good, don't worry, it's really okay. good. <laughs> so I'm just wondering about, you know, how you come to those characters, whether or not your parents yourselves or you're working with your own relationships to your parents or how you think about balancing them inside the story of the teenager. Well, I can't say on our show, like, again, going with the inside out, like, we really try to be mindful of, like, seeing, like, walking this fine line of seeing the parents and any adults through the teenager's perspective always, while also allowing them to be three-dimensional people and not just, like, the wah -wah -wah voice, you know? Um, but, yeah, like, especially... I mean, I can only speak from my experience, like what, a, you know, I come from such a matriarchal family. And I think like anytime I'm telling any story that I feel passionate about, I just feel like a mother is such a looming presence in that. And like also, you know, Vida was, you know, the mom, the whole premise of the show is in the pilot, spoiler alert, it's been out for a while, the mom that had died and these two daughters are returning back home to kind of deal and grieve and figure out what they're going to do. And although the mom is dead, she looms throughout the entire show, you know, and it's just like, I always love that about that show that the mom is always there, even though she's gone. Um, and so I don't know if what I'm saying is substantive at all, other than I agree that mothers are super important and I love them and I love mine. That is substantive and it does answer the question. And you're right about Vita. That's what makes that show so powerful. For me, what makes that show so powerful. Mm -hmm. Other folks? We, um, we, we, we touched on it with, when talking about just like the, the, the girls, but I feel like just trying to show like parents don't have to be all one thing. Like, like on, on my blog, it's like, the parents don't have to be absent or bad, like, or all of them don't, like, some of them can be, in, and then we can show just, like, you know, people with two, like, great parents, and parents who are just, like, flawed, like, you know, one of them's, like, we can show the parents have problems, but they're still a family, and just, like, the range, I guess, with the parents, and just, like, using them to, sh to just not, I don't know what I'm trying to say now, just keeping it fun and real, but, like, now I'm really, I'm going to stop answering this question. <laughs> oh, girl, I've got it. <laughs> I feel like it's the Zoom. I'm just like looking at my window. Um, oh, the sun is okay. fully setting. Uh, I'm, on the east, I'm on the East Coast. The full sun is fully setting. I'm like, oh, time. What is this? <laughs> You were like, I'm on the East Coast. And I was like, it is? Like, I, I don't know what time is. So I was like, let me look. Time is a flat circle. <laughs> Um, I will say this is an example of how I was very wrong in my room. I wanted the Babysitter's Club to be only about the girls. I didn't want to see a scene where there was not a child in it because one, it was kind of based off like the books. It's all of their like diary entries and I am a logic police nightmare um, <laughs> at times. And so I was like, they wouldn't know what like Liz and Sharon are talking about. 
Um, so I was like that girl last summer <laughs> when I had, that was the only thing I had to care about. Um, and <laughs> so, and then we had two moms in our room who I was like, y'all just want to have wine, the two of you. Like, I was like, this is what this is. Okay. This is what this scene is. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is it's like our parents affected us greatly. Our parents' moods affected us greatly. And, you know, people say, we talk about it now, like, go to therapy, get your shit worked out before you have kids because you don't want to, like, pass it on. But even if you are the most articulate about the things you're bringing into parenthood, you are going to put your, your stuff onto your children. And so by giving a little, you know, weight or respect back to the fact these humans decide to have you as a human no matter how infuriating they can be I'm saying this slowly my mother is in the house um <laughs> is I think it's really important when you're trying to when you think about character when you think about how they're gonna work so like I in my episode um Marianne has a little bit of a spat with her dad and so I was really fighting. I was really, he was annoying me. He's not, he's, I think he's a much sweeter man in the show than he was in the book. Sorry, Emma Martin, it is her birthday as well. Um, but it, I've like added, when I wrote with the permission of my boss, um, I added a scene that saw that he wasn't, you know, being a stick in the mud for no reason. It was because he was missing his wife who's no longer with us. Um, and you wouldn't know that if you're the little girl whose dad is like making a big deal about it. But I felt, you know, not to get like white cis men more of a platform, but I felt that it was important for if you're thinking I'm on the side of this little girl, okay, give a little context of like the pain that he's trying to work through. Um, so I was wrong. They were right. Whatever. Life is life goes on. Um, well, similarly, I mean, you know, in terms, w because our show uh, is an origin story of how this, this girl becomes president, which I know I said it's been homogenous, but also it's, it's not, it, the tides ha are turning, I will also say that, and it's not, I both, it's a, not 100% homogenous, um, thank God. Um, but I think we also were extra conscious of this being an origin story about like, you know, who, what are the forces in this girl's life that um, influence her to do, to be a great leader? Because you don't become, you don't become anybody in a vacuum. Um, you especially don't become a great leader in a vacuum. So it was really important for us to, to explore her relationship with her mother, with her mom's new boyfriend, with, you know, the adults in her life. Um, and, you know, the, the mother-daughter uh, relationship, you know, because also in, in terms of writing for teens, like, we're a room not of teens, and some of us are parents and some of us are not. But the same way, I mean, like you were saying, you become a parent with no guidebook. If there's anything I've learned from being in a room with parents and kind of breaking these stories about what it means to be a parent, it's like you are figuring it out as you go. And what a, what a wonderful thing to, to normalize and put on television. Um, the same way that these teenage characters are figuring things out. It's not like these moms or these parents are these kind of like wise oracles who appear at the end of a Full House episode to like offer advice. Yeah. They are slogging through the mud too. They're, they're flawed. They're human beings. Like we're writing full characters um, in the adults too. Um, and, and we can see a lot of the mother-daughter and how Elena is, um, you know, influenced by her mom and how both of them are kind of whether they're um sparring with one another or with their own indiv individual issues how they're kind of approaching it from similar ways um so yeah so it's it's a huge um it's and, it, and it's you know to right away where kids can also enjoy it and and kids don't like get up to go to the bathroom every time a grown-up enters the screen so i hope we're accomplishing that but and Sonia, particularly the relationship in um, Never Have I Ever, the fact that the I've read so many people say the most impressive moment was seeing the mom get on the motorcycle. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, sorry. I, I love your cat's energy. <laughs> this cat will not be ignored. And that's amazing. Give this cat a show. Yes. There's just two of them, and so they just, like, keep coming around. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I think that in, in Never Have I Ever is interesting because it's like, she's so, so intent on like, and focus on these boys and like the like idealistic, like memories of her father. And like, she's so like, that's her drive. It's about like 
let me get these boys, let me get with these boys. Um, remember my dad, like my dad is like just in my head. And like the whole time she's like, whenever her mom is involved, she's like, no, go away, go away. Like conflict, I don't, I don't want to deal with this. And like the, the biggest, I mean, maybe this is a spoiler, but like the, the, her arc is so much about like her coming back to her mom. Um, and I feel like it, it was, it's so real and satisfying and not just like, oh, her mom is her best friend. Um, like they don't connect. And it was just, it's great. It was great to see that played out in a real way. Um, Agree. <laughs> the mo- yeah, the, and the mom is super flawed too. And you see, like, it's, it's funny to see like, oh, you're her daughter. Like, this is real. Me, like, both of you are flawed in the same ways. I see how this is passed down. I see this playing out. I also love that, like, that that mom is so dope. Like, that mom is, like, her making it through her trauma while being, like, utterly amazing is so wonderful. And and that's also the thing of, like, growing up now when you find yourself, like, empathizing with the parents more. I'm like, oh, shit. That's why my hips hurt. Like, I really, like, cross, like, a friends of mine are rewatching the OC right now. And every time I like peek into them watching it, I'm like, these these aren't real people. These parents aren't real people because like, you know, Josh Schwartz was 24 when he came up with that show. He was closer to that side than this side. But the older you get, the more um, shades of rightness you give to your moms, I guess. <laughs> true, very true. Uh, all right, we're 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 coming down to the wire and I promised everybody we would get origin stories. You've kind of all admitted in the course of conversation, which is such a lovely thing, that you all came through the assistant ranks, which is a beautiful thing that wasn't true in this town maybe 20 years ago when they thought they were still secretaries and you were gonna do that for life. So it's wonderful to hear that. If you guys would each kind of give us the, also where you're from and how you got into writing in the first place, what made you take that assistant track on the route to being a writer? So who would like to give us their origin story first? I had a general right before this, so I can do it quickly. <laughs> um, I'm from Baltimore. I went to an all-girls school, so writing for all girls made a lot of sense for me. I um, went to Harvard, but I did not do the lampoon. I want to be clear about that. I um, came out here to LA and, <laughs> hey, DMV. Um, I uh, thought I wanted to be a producer. I thought I would either like be an executive or, and then eventually become Betsy Beers, who is Shonda's person. That's what my goal was. And when I was working at Lionsgate, I, I was just, as an assistant in development, I was so frustrated with the scripts my boss was having me read for staffing. And she's a very lovely woman named Cara DeLaverson, who is uh, head of drama at NBC. And she said, Chasha, you're going to have to figure out if you want to stay on this track, which I think you would love, or if you need to take more ownership of what you do. And so I did that. And I plotted to work for Junji Cohan. And I did. And so I called myself the hand of the queen. um, And she taught me everything. And I love her with my whole body. And now I'm a writer. (laughs) Ah, uh, 45 seconds. We did it. <laughs> Superhero origin story. That's yeah. beautiful. All right. Who wants to go next? That was good, Riri. That was impressive. I was like, let me just like really make it. <laughs> let me see. Let me see if I can do it. Let me see. Yeah. Let me see. Okay. So I came up in South Florida, Fort Lauderdale by way of New York, like New York uh, crew and family. And um, I got my start in this business as an actor and a performer. I always was. I came up as like a theater nerd, did that for many years, moved to New York. And it wasn't until I got to New York that I started to kind of burn out as an actor. And I just kind of felt uninspired by what I was auditioning for and kind of reenacting the same stereotypes over and over again. And felt like I have more to say. And so I started playwriting and kind of writing in earnest at that time because plays are like what I knew because I was doing theater. Um, And all the feedback I kept getting was like, this is really dope, but it's kind of cinematic. And uh, this is what you have to do to make it a play. (laughs) But great, you know, do a short film. That's super cool. And so after a while, I was like, why am I trying to like, get whatever off off Broadway production when I can like go to Hollywood and you know do the thing people are already saying my work lends itself to and kind of have um some real influence and like be where all of the stories that I was being most inspired by actually were happening which is on TV 
And so I moved out here about two and a half years ago. And my first job was Tanya Saracho. She uh, hired me to be her writer's assistant in a mini room of a project she was developing at the time. And um, yeah, I, I just like really took to it and loved it. Like I knew I would, and it's just been kind of gangbusters from there. And then this last job, I was their, their writer's assistant as well. And then they promoted me and now I'm a fish. Promote your assistants. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, promote your assistants. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I'm also from South Florida. I'm from Miami. Um, and yeah, my, and, uh, so yeah, so we should talk. Um, and I was a theater nerd too. I, you know, did all, I know, um, yeah, talk. Did play, yeah. um, wanted to be an actor, director. I like wanted to do it all. I wanted to like live in a loft in New York and like walk across the street with like a script under my arm and like do it all. Um, uh, I went to Northwestern where I was a theater major um, and I still wanted to do it all, but I, I'm trying to go fast too. I ultimately kind of- um, I went to DePaul. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I went to oh DePaul. My God. This is weird. We were living on like a very similar track. We really need to side chat. Y'all just pitch, uh, pitch this show. You got it. Just pitch the show. Uh, okay. and, Seriously, we were both so in Chicago, and I, um, and I was Tanya Soracho actually was like, I was looking at her, and I was like, she was a playwright who became a TV writer, and she's Latina, and like, I want to be her. Um, and at Northwestern, I was, I ended up doing playwriting, and then I did this program called Creative Writing for the Media, where you did a different kind of like screenwriting every quarter. And fall of TV was TV, or fall, I gave it away, fall of senior year was TV writing. And it kind of all clicked for me. And as it was clicking for me, I was realizing that I was kind of like falling out of love with like pursuing acting. Um, and so I was like, I wanna write for TV. This combines everything I love about theater and still love about theater. Um, and I still write plays sometimes with what I'm starting to love about film. It's collaborative, it's character driven. I love it. I moved to New York because I, again, I had this image of myself. I'd never been to LA. Um, um, but I couldn't find like an assistant job in TV because there, or I did, but it was a non-scripted. So I moved to LA. I worked um, in LA. I worked three different assistant jobs on three different shows before I landed on Crazy X. I think that's yeah. huge. Um, everyone's always like, wow, overnight you did Crazy X and then you were promoted to writer's assistant and then you were promoted to staff writer. And I was like, it wasn't, it was my fifth job. And anyway, um, so many, many jobs, many, many bosses landed on Crazy X as a showrunner's assistant, was promoted to writer's assistant, co-wrote an episode with them, uh, was promoted to staff writer while I was pitching, um, Diary, and then I sold Diary, um, during season four of Crazy Ex-Girlfriend and had to leave early to staff that room. <laughs> so, Did that's it. that. I think that's it. <laughs> Excellent. Sonia. That's awesome. Wait, were you, you said, were you a staff writer or writer assistant when you got to leave the room to go make your own show? Oh, I was a staff writer. It wasn't oh. that big flex. <laughs> oh, no, that's, girl, that's a flex. Good <laughs> on you. That's a huge flex. Um, um, it was, I was just telling people, though, how, like, like grow, growing up in a room and being able to pitch a show and say, gonna go do a pitch here today and having a room of smart people give advice. And like, be like, oh, here's how what I do for a pitch. Like, it's again, not in a vacuum. I very yeah. much. Sorry. Yeah, that's awesome. Support's important. It's important to recognize that we need supporting each other for anyone to move up in this business. Totally. Um, yeah, I'm from uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul suburbs, um, and I I wanted to be a writer from when, when I was I was super into writing and super into TV. I was a huge like fan. I had a friends fan site like that was actually like a really big friends fan site uh, through like high school. And uh, it was like the only thing I did. This is why I didn't, this is why I was a late bloomer. Cause I was just like on my computer and watching TV. Um, and uh, yeah, then came out here, um, came out to LA for school for like screenwriting prep school. And then um, after that got an internship through that, um, got like an interview and a job uh, in the mailroom at WME um, and did that whole kind of mailroom to like, worked on two different desks um, at WME, wanted to work for a showrunner, kind of always knew like what I wanted to do. Um, so every job kind of like, I would just like talk about that and talk about what I was watching and like my taste and the next job I wanted, just like 
I mean, I guess that's what you do with your coworkers and stuff, but I feel like those conversations are what like land, landed me the opportunities um, yeah. just because, you know, people remember and your friends remember. And um, that's like when you're building your network. So um, that sounded so douchey building your network, but I, I got, I got all of my jobs like through like friends that I'd made at other jobs who, who were like, Oh, you like this thing. This person's looking for whatever. Um, and then worked, uh, was a showrunner assistant on the blacklist at NBC it's season one. Um, <laughs> I worked on a pilot before that that didn't go. Um, we worked at the same, we were on different pilots at the same time when we were children. Sure. That's so crazy. Yeah, girl. The glow up is miraculous. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. In that little office. In that little office. Thing. Just take Woo. <laughs> um, wow. Yeah, and then uh uh after that um was Mindy's assistant for two seasons and the writer's assistant for two seasons of the mini project. Then um in between, at some point, I had worked, like, during a long hiatus, I was a writer's assistant on season one of On My Block, and then Mindy promoted me and Lauren promoted me onto the various shows, which was awesome. Wow. <laughs> They're both so great, and, um, and yeah, just learned so much from both of them, and yeah. Sure. Well, that is the most perfect timing and the most beautiful set of stories to share with all the people that I know have signed on. There's over like 400 people that are listening to us, even though we can't hear their applause. Um, but you have given them advice and a positivity and a feeling that they have a space in this business and that all the different underrepresented voices, it's time. And I think that's probably the most important message we've given. Um, and then focused in that it's time for girls <laughs> and to take girls seriously because their stories matter their stories help them grow up to be president someday we can only hope um so i'm very happy that you all have shared this time with us i want to thank you so much for your time uh i want to thank the writers guild for working together with stevens college it's something we really appreciate their time doing and we hope that everyone who was here tonight has had a marvelous time i've looked at their questions i've asked my questions and i thank you all for your honesty and your positivity everybody have a great night Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.